very nice to be here with a group of really sincere practitioners. And I always feel so lifted up by the chanting in the beginning. It's really enlivening and, yeah, fills me with delight, actually. <laughs> so I thought tonight I'd um, share a little bit more about my journey and what brought me into monastic life and also talk a bit about the importance that in my practice of, um, of really exploring this field of uh, bodily sensations and the way that that's all connected to our emotional world. And partly this is inspired by um, some questions that came to me in, in Devon when I was um, invited to teach for one evening at the Barn Retreat Centre. Um, they told me it would be a Q&A, so I was thinking, uh, oh, that's easy, you know, I just have a whole big list of questions. But actually there were only two questions, so I realised that somehow I had to form a kind of talk out of that. Um, but one of the questions which I thought was very interesting and also could be helpful to all of us was this. So I said, I'm interested in the body aspects of letting go. When we hold tension, we contract and it can work against our histories to let go. How does your approach to meditation assist in the body process of letting go of emotions? So that was interesting contemplation for me. I definitely don't think of it as being my approach. <laughs> Certainly the Buddha paid, you know, gave strong importance to sensations and because you know whatever we experience in the mind has its counterpart in the body. It always has a, a correlating sensation, but often we're not aware of that. We don't give that much attention. Uh, but to me, this is very key because emotions in themselves can be quite transient or insubstantial or quite, uh, what's the word, ephemeral? Quite vague, you know, it's hard to grasp sometimes. But when we become more aware of what's happening at the bodily level, we find that they are reflected in our systems, you know. So it's easy to see with things like anger or fear, you know. With anger, sometimes the heart starts to race, you know. Or maybe there can be a heat that starts to be generated in the body. You know, the kind of archetypal angry face is one that's quite red and even quite contorted, you know. You might feel tension starting to happen in the eyes. And these are all kind of signs that something's coming up, sometimes before we even know what's happening at the emotional level. You know, we, the body starts to change. And the same thing with fear, you know, fear is often, for me, it manifests in the abdomen quite often, you know, there's a kind of tightening or contraction or just a sense of um, shakiness. And then you're sort of aware that something has triggered that, something from outside has triggered that. But often we feel that these sensations are, are due to the outside objects. And in a sense that's true because the outside objects come into contact with, a, with us at one of the sense doors. So the Buddha talked about, you know, the six senses. And he said that basically there are sights outside, but they come into contact with the eye sense door. And due to that, eye consciousness arises. You know, when there's a sound outside, it comes in contact with the ear sense door. Due to that, ear consciousness arises, or hearing arises, yeah? And the same with thoughts. They come into contact with the mind, and then we're aware of the thoughts. And then, of course, like tactile objects, you know, like I can feel my own hands. So that becomes an object, in a sense. I can feel the sensation then in my legs. And it's only when we have this contact that we actually experience the world without any contact at the physical level through one of the sense doors. You know, there's no connection. So the Buddha said that, you know, it's contact which is the cause of sensation or feeling. Yeah, the word Vedana, I mean, the word Vedana is actually even wider than feeling or sensation. Sometimes it's translated as experience. You know, and it's it's through that experience at the level of sensation, at the level of hearing, sound, sight, taste, smell, and physical touch, that we know the world. <coughs> and so for my journey, it's been uh, a really key part. And I think for me, 
my interest in the spiritual path started with um, quite a strong period of depression, actually, in my teens at quite a young age. And uh, I was only about 15 and everything was going very well in my life until then. Um, you know, I had a lovely best friend since I was four years old, I had a really nice family, um, a very nice town to grow up in. I didn't, I don't remember feeling stressed at school or having any kind of deadlines or even any, particularly, any homework or, or you know, exams. Nowadays I hear they want to give four-year-olds exams, which is just scary, you know. I, I didn't feel any of that sort of pressure. And so everything was going very nicely, you know. And then in my teens, suddenly, I, I got a sense that actually the world outside wasn't as um, um, benign, perhaps, or peaceful as I thought it was, you know. I mean, this w went hand in hand with hormones and all the rest of, of the teen years, which we don't really get taught much about, um, so I wasn't expecting it. But um, I really remember sort of watching the news and, and just being shocked at the atrocities we can do to each other, you know, and just and reflecting on why that can happen, realising it was basically to do with greed and to do with power, you know, most of the time. Um, and I, I remember just feeling kind of so much suffering related to that, and it felt like it was more than my own suffering. I mean, I had my own kind of teenage kind of what's the meaning, why am I here, but it was also a sense of why is the world the way it is, and why is there so much suffering? <coughs> And more than that, what is the what is a wise response? Like, how can I actually respond to that and do good in the world? You know, and at that time, I just felt quite swamped by it, actually. Um, and and no one around me seemed to understand that. You know, I'd talk to people, and they'd just say, "Well, you know, what's wrong with you? You've got a nice life. You've got a nice family. You're good at school, and you know all the rest of it." And of course, I started to feel perhaps that meant there was something wrong with me. You know, other people weren't feeling this. But it was a really a burning question, like, why is there so much suffering, and, and what is a compassionate response? And I think for me that was the beginning of a spiritual path. At the time, obviously, those sensations, you know, I had a lot of crying, I had a lot of, um, I guess you'd just call it depression and despair. Um, and I think I was very aware of that, I had the awareness, but there was also the rolling in it, you know, and getting swamped by it, and, and very identified with that and not really knowing how to navigate it very well, you know. But I felt quite sure that there must be a reason for it and there must be a way out. Um, only nothing in my environment or my um, upbringing was <coughs> indicating what that might be. Perhaps if I'd been brought up in a Buddhist environment or even in India, because India was the first country I actually went to, um, almost the first, uh, when I left England in search. Um, I think if I'd have been born in one of those cultures it might have been easier to, to have my experience mirrored back because over there people do talk about suffering, they talk about life, they talk about death, you know, the key tenets of existence basically, life, death, not just kind of what am I going to have for dinner or, you know, am I going to go out like with pink hair or black hair today, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff that we're preoccupied by. So, uh, yeah, this kind of very strong experience um, was the start of my spiritual path, really, and it took me to India when I was 19. I felt a bit adventurous. The previous year I'd been to Israel with my best friend, and, uh, and this time we felt we wanted a little bit more, like, maybe more of a challenge. But honestly, you can make a story around it, but to me it feels more like a calling. <coughs> you know, I can give my reasons for why I went there, but there weren't really any. It was just, let's go. <laughs> And um, as soon as I got there, I realised there was... I mean, at first it was very intimidating to be kind of the only young white woman in the street, and uh, apart from my friend, and just see basically Indian men around me and a lot of uh, what looked like rubble, really, mud and wires hanging here and there and buildings that were kind of toppling in on each other. And we were in one of the poorest and roughest parts of the city. Um... But, uh, yeah, after a few days and, and the journey to the Himalayas, I started to relax a bit, and I just started to realise that people seemed to have a sense of something beyond themselves. And although there was this obvious and fairly extreme poverty, there seemed to be a sense of connection. People seemed to be connected to a life force or a kind of 
sense of being part of humanity, yeah? part of whether it was a community or whether it was like a large family or even perhaps a religion. It seemed like people had some kind of connection that I wasn't feeling. And there was a certain joy there. And I also intuited that this was not because of the su- it was not because there was no suffering. It was more um, perhaps due to a connection to it, which brought about a greater sense of appreciation and gratitude for life. So people could have very little, you know, but there'd be a certain aliveness and a certain sense of we have to make the best of this. We have to, you know, use our life for something really worthwhile. And it's amazing to see that, you know, when people don't have much, they really, it brings about a sense of um, wanting not only to survive, but to really thrive in life. And I kind of felt that we didn't have that so much in the West. Maybe things were a bit too easy. I don't know. But anyway, this all led to me um, being very fascinated, really, by the mind and the way the mind worked. And um, I noticed that my depression lifted quite radically. You know, I felt much more part of life. Um, and a peace with life and I also felt that there wasn't a denial of suffering and I think the first thing I read actually about the Buddha's teaching was um, in some kind of magazine and it just said desire is the cause of suffering and I just it, it just kind of struck a chord really deeply I just thought of course you know, if I have no desire that means I'm content if I have desire, that means there's something lacking, there's a lack. And it was just really potent for me. And I realized that the happiness I was searching for was probably more of a contentment than a kind of exuberance or a kind of eternal joy, you know, which is really quite impossible. It felt much more realistic to think that suffering was caused by desire. Simple. You know, if I, if I want to be where I am, What's the problem? There's no problem. That just doesn't mean physically, it means emotionally or, you know, with who I'm with at the moment, and sometimes that's myself. You know, wanting to be here with myself in whatever condition I happen to be in. So this was really interesting for me, and then I did my first retreat, because I just wanted to see what would happen to my mind, really, if I was in silence for ten days, and whether or not I don't know, I'd find some kind of tool or, you know, when the suffering arose, how would my mind respond to that if just left basically on its own? How would, would I kind of bring myself out of that? Or, you know, I wanted to really know what was going on basically in my mind um, because I knew that my suffering was nothing to do with the externals. You know, it was very clear. Like I say, I had a nice life, nice family and all the rest. So it was very clear that it must be coming from inside. And in that retreat, we worked a lot with bodily sensations, and we really started to see this kind of point in the chain of um, dependent origination. I don't know how much people know about this, but basically it starts with um, delusion, not knowing the true nature of things. Yeah? And then from delusion, let me get it right now, Jasankara, there's a kind of reaction to that. Yeah? There's a kind of um, generating of mental volition usually through craving, through some kind of craving. So delusion leads to sankara, avijja pacha, sankara, sankara, pacha, vinyana, and from that the consciousness arises. So it's like we have a moment maybe of, um, I mean this is a very a strong example, but say we have a moment of hatred, the next consciousness, the next conscious moment that arises is based on that, it's based on the last moment. So that leads into you know, a response, a reaction, and the consciousness that arises is, is one of anger and hatred. Yeah. So, how is it? So when there's consciousness, then we get the six senses. Yeah. There's consciousness of the eye, the nose, the ear, the tongue, the body, and the mind. And from that, we get the contact with the world so because we have these senses we have also the corresponding sense objects in the world and when they come into contact then the sensation so the next thing is from contact we get experience or sensation and the really interesting link is that from that sensation or that contact 
craving arises, desire arises, or aversion arises, yeah? And so this is what I was pointing to in the meditation, that when we have, say, a pleasant experience, it tends towards a response of wanting more, yeah? There's the underlying tendency to greed whenever we experience pleasant sensation through any of the sense doors. When we experience unpleasant sensation, then we have this, like, corresponding tendency to aversion. We don't want it. We want to kind of get rid of it or push it away. Yeah. And then with the neutral sensation, which is kind of neither pleasant nor unpleasant, it's kind of perhaps a bit undefined or difficult to experience, you know. We have this underlying tendency to boredom or disinterest, so our mind just kind of turns off to it. Sometimes that's experienced in getting a bit drowsy or falling to sleep. So there's these sensations and, you know, the not wanting or the craving is a kind of reaction to that. And from there, the suffering, you know, starts to accumulate, basically. And so this is a very pivotal point in the path, you know, where we can start to come in contact with what's happening and yet notice when we start to react in ways that generate more suffering and perhaps learn a different way of responding. So the question that this lady wrote to me, you know, about um, the body aspects of letting go and, and holding tension in the body, it's kind of often the result of a lot of these reactions and responses to something that arises that we don't want, you know. And so our body is kind of tense up to it. For example, say in trauma, if there's a trauma, it's often really lodged in the body, you know. Or if, say, you do too much work on my computer, which I often do, and there's a certain stress involved in that, and you feel the shoulders kind of come up, you know, and then you start holding it a certain way. Or even something subtler, say, you know, say you are someone with quite a lot of anxiety, you're kind of trying to protect yourself, so perhaps a part of you feels quite vulnerable, and there can be a contraction and a, a holding, you know, of the stomach muscles, for example, that, you know, you sort of want to go inwards. Sometimes you see people actually quite stooped and you feel like it's a protective kind of posture. And what I was learning with this practice was that um, by coming in contact with these sensations I could learn a different response. I could actually meet them at the level of contact and notice first of all how I was responding and then also start to investigate kind of whether these sensations were really um, really solid in the way that I thought they were yeah so the practice was kind of learning to really experience them because first of all with suffering we need to meet it in order to understand it right? we don't just jump into the letting go because often people ask the question you know how do I let go of tension I mean the main answer is that we first have to meet and make peace with that we first have to actually experience what's happening and find ways to get close to it Sometimes it's too painful to go into it with a sledgehammer or to just kind of use all your focus to kind of zoom in on, on that area. That might not be skillful, especially if it's something that's, you know, quite protective or quite delicate. We might want to kind of creep up on it gradually. And so for this, this tool of kindness is absolutely indispensable. You know, we have this ability to be aware as human beings. We have the ability to be conscious of what's happening. But we can also use that consciousness as a kind of medium through which we can channel kindness. It's like through that awareness we've made contact with the sensation, we've made contact with the inner experience. Now we've made contact, can we actually you know, channel kindness towards that experience? Just the way you would meet a friend. You know? When I came in here today, we all kind of hugged together. You know, each person hugged. It was like a very gentle and very embracing feeling of, yes, I welcome you, and I'm happy that you're here, you know. And I give you my kindness and my care. So in a way, we need to learn to respond to our inner world in the same way, like as a friend, not as something we control or something we judge, something we push around and say, hey, you know, I need you to be different, or don't come today, come tomorrow, you know. It's like, yeah, okay, you're here. How can I meet you now with kindness and care? So I think this is really, really key in the meeting. You know, how do we actually meet? And we're meeting in order to understand. Yeah? So we need to meet in a way that we're able to actually stay with something long enough to understand its nature. Yeah? 
So there are different ways of this, and I just wanted to talk about a few of them. I mean, like I say, one is a kind of zoom-in approach, where you just kind of hone in on that sensation. But I think we have to be very careful with that. Sometimes we have a powerful mind, and we feel ready, we feel confident. It's like the kind of child, I mean, I have a niece, and she's quite fearless. She would probably see a pool of water and just jump, you know, or she'd see a tree and just, like, she'd be up there before you could stop her. <laughs> but this takes a lot of courage and a kind of sense of fearlessness, and also quite a sense of resourcefulness, safety, yeah? And we're not always feeling that safe. So the other method is to kind of imagine, for example, you have that big lake or that big pool of water, and it's a little bit daunting, you know, it's somewhere we've not been before. So at first we just put our toe in, that's it, you know, just put the toe in, feel the water, okay, it's cold, take it out. That's as much as we need to do, yeah. So that's like when we're going through the body for sensations, we see something difficult, okay, it's difficult, like, let me just back off a bit. I don't have to go right into it or stay there, you know, I can just feel it, back off a bit, or give it a bit of space. Maybe you don't want to be aware only of that area, but you can be aware of the area around it as well, so that it has a context, so it feels that it's held in something bigger. Yeah? And that's why I like to kind of get that whole body sense, because sometimes we notice then, oh, there's more than just my suffering or my tension or, you know, the fear. There's also something quite relaxed, maybe in the hands or the feet or, you know, just a general sense of yeah, how it feels to sit up a certain sense of ease in that, or ground, or some ground in that. Yeah. So this is one way to kind of meet things, just putting your toe in. And then when that feels okay, you know, we can probably go in up to the knees and stay a bit longer, you know. It's a few waves, it's not too big. Mm -hmm. We can stay in a bit, and then gradually, you know, we might dare to actually swim. And at that point, usually the ocean doesn't seem like a scary place. You can really dive right in, you know, and even float and you know, feel held on the waves. But we can't do that all at once, we have to do it incrementally in steps. Yeah. There was another nice example in my time at um, Guy House in Devon. I've spent a few months there now, um, both as resident teacher, so helping people with their own practice, and also on retreat myself. And um, when I was on one of my retreats, this lady came and gave me a big tub of bird food before she left, and I thought, oh, now I'm going to be, you know, feeding the birds for the next month. I was a bit like, not sure I want to do that. But it was a really interesting experience, because I noticed that in the beginning I'd put it on the windowsill, and the birds would be quite afraid to come up, because they didn't know me, you know, I'd just arrived there. And so they'd only come when nobody was looking, you know, when the windows were closed. But then after a while they started to realise that they were getting nice cashew nuts and stuff that they didn't normally get from the trees or, you know, <laughs> from the earth. And quite easy, they didn't have to risk very much to get them. So once they got a taste for it, they, they started to come more often and I could actually stand behind the window and they'd still come. Uh, and it got to the point where I could open the window and they'd still come, you know. And then I tried very carefully with my little, um, what is it, a tablet thing to take a photo and one day I actually managed to take a photo with them taking the food and gradually they got used to this thing sitting there and they'd still come even if I was waiting with the camera. <laughs> so they were starting to get kind of less fear you know and you could see it, you could see them starting to relax and then at a certain point I thought would they still come if I actually held my hand out? It's just the difference between standing here and putting my hand there with the cashew nuts. And to my amazement, the one little booty actually grabbed hold of my <laughs> finger. I had to stay quite steady because it really grabbed, you know. And then it took the nut. <laughs> and this happened. It started happening. Once it had taken it once, it realised it was safe. And it also, I put the biggest nut there, right? The other small ones were on the windowsill. <laughs> 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 so this is like meditation, actually. Sometimes the biggest piece and the one that you get most reward from is the difficult one. <laughs> yeah? That's where the most scope for growth is. So it came to take this big cashew nut and then I, I, I decided to play a little bit and I thought will it still come if I put like not the cashew nut just another thing in my hand and the next time it came it saw there was no nut. <coughs> it bit me. <laughs> it bit me. Yeah. So it was starting to get pretty bold, pretty confident you know. So I wouldn't advise that part of the process. But it was interesting to see how incrementally, you know, with realising that there was a, a benefit and there was a, 
a kind of nourishment in coming closer, it, w it was easier to start coming in. And I think it's the same with practice. When we start to gradually come closer to the bits that we've maybe rejected or maybe we're afraid of, we start to see that, oh, when we're actually able to meet that, there's a release. And I think there can be quite a lot of insight in that because you start to see that the suffering isn't actually in the sensation or in the emotion. It's actually in the not wanting it. It's in the resisting it that we have the suffering. Yeah. And just in learning to meet it, we develop a certain confidence and also compassion arises. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's certainly the most difficult experiences in my life that have, at the time, felt overwhelming, but later been the biggest kind of scope for really developing compassion into areas I didn't understand before. You know. And that has enabled me to be able to help others in similar situations, you know, that I could never have done before. But it's hard to remember that when you're in something. I know it's really hard at that time to remember. But, um, yeah, there are so many different ways of working. So that's a kind of meeting in gradual stages. And then the next thing when we've met is to learn how to stay with something. Yeah? To learn how to really sustain our attention. And this is interesting too. We can really play with the way we use our mindfulness. You know, sometimes we can zoom in, sometimes we can come out again. Sometimes, you know, we want a, a more generalized feeling. Sometimes we want just a kind of, yeah, a tighter hold, maybe, you know. It's the same with the breath. Sometimes with the breath, we can really relax and sit back from it, and it can just come in and out on its own. At other times, we need to just hold it a little bit, just in order to keep it present, you know. But then as soon as the grasp gets too tight, we tend to lose it, it slips off because the cravings come back into it. We're no longer just with the experience. Yeah, so this is kind of sustaining. And the most important thing at this stage, I think, is to keep very, very aware of your attitude. Very, very aware of qualities such as kindness and gentleness and patience. You know, and just having the trust that things will open up in their own time. Yeah. So not trying to let go. So when people talk about letting go and how do we do it, I would say it's not through, you know, trying to push things away, it's actually the opposite. Letting go is born of wisdom. Yeah. When we see that things are actually causing us suffering, whether the sensations or our emotional reactions to them, it's easier to let it go. Yeah. So it's the obvious example of, that the Buddha talks about as well in the suttas of the burning coal. You know, when you hold the burning coal, you don't need any, anyone to tell you to put it down. As soon as you realize it's burning, you drop it. And as we become more and more sensitive to these sensations and to our reactions, and we see how we're creating our own suffering for ourselves, we start to gradually just let it go, naturally. It's very natural. And that was the amazing thing for me after my first retreat, because I didn't think anything much happened there. I mean, it was just meeting this world that was quite intense and quite you know, unknown to me, um, and realizing that, gosh, you know, my own reactions are causing most of my suffering. But also realizing the kind of implications of that, that that meant I could actually do something about my suffering, you know, without having to fix the world outside, I could actually learn to respond in a different way, you know, to, to respond with maybe equanimity, like just balance and patience, and also to see that this things were changing all the time anyway. You know, there was no need for me to hang on to them. And so seeing that kind of impermanence and, you know, the inherent kind of unsatisfactoriness of these things really helped me to start finding more contentment in my own experience, whatever was happening, and to get less pushed about by, you know, by the world and by the kind of vicissitudes, the ups and downs of life. And the amazing thing was, even though I hadn't had any big revelations or much particular joy or bliss or any of those things that, you know, are talked about in deeper meditation, after my retreat I found there was just much less interest in things even like music, which I was really very quite obsessed with at that time, you know. I absolutely loved music and also reading a lot or just generally entertaining myself, you know. I guess I'd realised that I was just content without that, yeah. And it wasn't a kind of condemnation of those things at all. I mean, if I wanted to listen to music, I would, you know. I wasn't a nun at that point, so 
it wasn't a problem, but I just found it more pleasant to be really engaged with the moment and with whatever I happened to be doing. You know? And I was having so many new experiences in India, just getting on a local bus going up to the Himalaya, you know, and being surrounded by people there from all kinds of different uh, traditions or ethnic backgrounds, you know, and chickens in there, goats in there sometimes. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to be there with the sounds that were around me. I didn't need to kind of close myself off with different sounds to kind of generate a different emotion. It was enough to be just present. And I think that's the beautiful thing about this practice of being really connected to the experience through sensations. Sensations are always present now. You know. There can't be much proliferation into the past and the future when you're just with whatever's arising in the body. It's very tangible and you can meet it now. And it also it's changing. So the other really transformative part of this practice for me was that um, we really focused on the changing nature of sensations in these retreats. So after that first retreat, I, I saw such big changes, I decided to commit probably the rest of my life to that, to the practice of the Buddha, basically. And I, I then sat my second course a few months later and, and started to serve also in retreats because they were all offered voluntarily and run by servers, basically. Nobody was being paid to run these courses. So it was all voluntary. And I just realised, you know, I've got so much from this, I want to give back. So I would sit and serve retreat after retreat, as many as I could every year, <laughs> and kept coming back to India. You know, I lived most of my life there, in Nepal as well, for the next seven years. So, and what started to happen in these retreats was that the investigation went deeper, yeah? So first of all, we have the right attitude. Then we learn to meet. We learn to sustain the attention. But the next stage is to investigate. And this is where the wisdom starts to take off. You start to see that these sensations are constantly changing. Yeah. We think something solid, like a pain in the knee or even fear, can feel quite... Okay, it feels fluttery, but it's kind of permanent. It's lodged. <laughs> you know, you don't really notice that it's, it has its peak and then it settles. You know, when something's arising that's quite compelling, we, we tend to think it's permanent. But through this practice, we really started to... It's like you put on a pair of glasses, and it's like the glasses of impermanence, yeah? The glasses of change. So you look particularly noticing change, and you start to see that everything's arising and passing quite quickly. Yeah, so at first sometimes you just notice there's different components to, to pain. So say a knee pain, at first it feels like just pain. But then you start to look more closely and you see, ah, okay, there's aching in there, or there's some throbbing in there, or maybe some heat, or some tension in there. And you start to see, oh, there's different things happening together. It's not just this solid thing. And then you start to see how it's moving. Sometimes people have things called shooting pains and you, you kind of feel it's like a, a, a needle or something pricking. It's not there the whole time, there's gaps, you know. So this is kind of like the ways in to seeing that things are changing. And over time, by going through the body time and again, you know, and getting familiar with these sensations, you start to see that they are actually arising and passing so quickly you can't really hold them. There's actually nothing substantial in them, you know. And for me this was amazing when I was bringing it into my daily life. So for example, like in the past, I might meet somebody who perhaps I would have a disease around, yeah? Perhaps somebody seemed a little bit aggressive or, um, I don't know, sometimes you can even just take an instant dislike to somebody for no apparent reason. And in the past I might have thought, oh, it's that person. But now I was noticing that, you know, that object was in my, in my mind, the person was, you know, I was seeing them at the level of sight, I was hearing them, whatever, noticing them, the way they move, the way they speak. But there was also a sensation in my body. And if I could remain with that sensation, I could actually see that it was changing all the time. So there might be a slight contraction, but then it was like releasing, or, or I'd just feel it like as a flow of energy in my body. And I could feel that it was caused by that contact, but it, there was nothing there. It was just passing away almost as soon as it was arising. <laughs> And an enormous amount of stability came from that, and equanimity came from that. And I could just meet that person and not buy into this reaction, not relate that to the person. It's almost like I'm doing my own work with my reaction, and therefore I can have space for that person to be exactly as they are. I don't need to change them. 
my work is not in the outside situation, it's in doing my work on my own responses and reactions. And so when I could deal with that, there wasn't a problem anymore on the outside and I could respond with compassion or with, yeah, even with love. Because yeah. sometimes in these retreats which I would serve, you know, people would come in quite an agitated state sometimes, you know. It's not easy to be alone for 10 days, later it was like 30 days retreats, you know, with, with basically no contact and just dealing with what's arising. So sometimes people could be very agitated. But I would notice that the more I was in touch with my own sensations, I could first of all felt some ground and some kind of, yeah, some kind of real balance and equipoise in my own mind. And then my response was just compassion. It would just calm compassion. Because the whatever kind of sensations would normally underlie a reaction were just kind of dissolving, and I was aware of it as it was happening. And I think this is just so powerful, you know, when we get to that point and... and we can see how impermanent these things are. There's no need, there's no meaning in holding on anymore. And so craving can't really arise at that time. Yeah. But this is kind of the beginning stage on the path also, because over time you start to see that when you are able to be more and more detached from these things and less caught up with them, they actually start to fade away altogether like the velocity or the force, the intensity of experience itself starts to fade. It actually starts to disappear because we're not fueling it again and again with like, I want it or I don't want it or, you know, identifying with it. And when we don't identify with something, it, it loses its power, it loses its hold. And so this can then start to lead into deeper states of calm in the, in the body and mind. And the body starts to kind of fade a little bit. You know, and sensations start to become softer and at these points the mind can really start to settle into deeper states of calm yeah. and the Buddha said you know that uh, a lot can be done through through observing and then you know weakening the craving but the end of suffering isn't just in the way we relate to things it's actually in letting go of things altogether yeah, and letting them fade altogether so there are certain kinds of experience in the body and mind which are more wholesome. There's a certain kind of happiness which is not based on the senses. It's based more on a, a calm mind or on the beautiful qualities of heart like gratitude or love or compassion, equanimity. And these are really wholesome happinesses, wholesome pleasant sensations, if you like, yeah, that are less based on the senses. But even that, you know, has to come to an end at some point. So we develop these qualities and we know how to pursue happiness. But the Buddha said that the highest happiness is when sensations and experience altogether ceases. Yeah. And he called that Sanya Vedayati Niroda. That means the end of perception and feeling altogether. So this is kind of difficult to understand at first, you know. And sometimes we might think, that sounds scary or that sounds like kind of beyond me. Mm -hmm. But I think the beauty of this practice is that we start to see that the less we hold, the less things kind of have a hold on us, you know, and things start to fade. And when things start to fade, you know, even in the practice, the body starts to fade or the breath starts to become much more subtle. There's more happiness, there's more peace. Yeah. And we can really allow that peace to fill the mind and to kind of dissolve a sense of self actually, dissolve a sense of needing to be the centre of experience all the time, you know. It's almost like the more we let go, the more the Dhamma can start to manifest. Yeah. The qualities themselves. So enlightened people aren't people with no feelings, you know. They're people who basically run on compassion and loving kindness and equanimity and joy. These are the qualities that they they have because you know, the other reactivity and identification with experience is completely gone. They don't identify, it's not like my problem if I'm feeling sadness. They can let the emotions come. I mean, the emotions are likely to be very, very subtle indeed, you know, but uh, they're, not, they're not holding onto that. And when you don't hold, things fade, right? I mean, if I have sand in my hand and I kind of, you know, part my fingers, then the sand falls away. My hand's empty. Or when there's a hot coal, you know, and I let it go, it's, it's no longer burns me. 
So it's similar to that, and it's an incremental thing. So I'm not sure if... Um, I didn't quite intend to go to that point. <laughs> and I realise there's a sort of danger in doing so, in a, in a sense. But I think I also just want to encourage everybody that it's a gradual process and that we can get clear signs on the path of which way we're moving. And I think as long as you maintain in mind that this path is supposed to lead to a disengagement, a letting go, a pacifying, and a peace, then we know how to meditate. Yeah? Because whenever you start to react to anything that's arising in the body or mind, and it's easy to see at the level of sensations, whenever we start to react to that, we increase our own suffering. We compound it. You know, It's like, oh, this is a problem. And the mind just goes straight to the problem. But when we can back off, you know, so to speak, like mentally, emotionally, even energetically, you know, so for example, by widening the felt sense of experience, the mind tends to contract when it's, you know, getting pulled into something difficult, widen it again, step back from it again. Then you notice things start to settle down. And when they start to settle, notice that too, you know, because that's really important. So at the end of the meditation, I always say, like, notice what happened, you know, what happened when you reacted, how was that? What happened when you used kindness, how was that? How did that affect experience? It's not to say it's right or wrong, but just learn how the mind works, and learn what kind of qualities help in the practice. And you can be sure that if it leads to peace and disengagement and, and contentment, really, then you're on the path. Yeah. But it's gradual and we don't jump to that. We first meet it. Yeah. That way we turn suffering into something that has the potential for liberation. So welcome your suffering. <laughs> welcome it as a friend with a very gentle touch. Yeah. And don't forget curiosity and play and patience, lots of patience. Yeah. So that's all for me. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.